OK, hello. All. So as I said in a lesson um, recently, I'm just going to go through a kind of slideshow that I've made just to give you a couple of reminders on on 1922 to 1929. I don't feel like there's any expectation that you need to take any uh, notes whilst uh, watching this. All I would like you to do is just simply watch it uh, and just uh, listen to the points that I want to make about uh, where we kind of came from on Britain last year. Just have a reminder uh, before we go back into it um, after half term. Uh, I wouldn't use this as a revision resource at all. I'm completely ad libbing it. There's no script. It's just what I've kind of got on the slides and what I can kind of remember off the top of my head. Uh, so it's just more of a, a transition into your second year of your Britain course, if anything. Uh, so where we start is in 1922, uh, specifically on the 19th of October 1922, which is the meeting at the famous kind of Colton Club, uh, which today has kind of been now called the kind of 1922 committee within the Conservative Party. Uh, and the Conservatives are coming together to talk about the coalition. David Lloyd George has become increasingly um, controversial, uh, both for the scandal over uh, Chanak, where he's kind of threatening war uh, with Turkey after the, the horrors of World War One, um, but also uh, the cash runners scandal in which he is outwardly, purposefully and publicly uh, selling peerages, uh, baronies uh, and all sorts of honours to people that can afford them. So I'll just go through what a couple of individuals in the Conservative Party said at this Carlton Club meeting. So the first we have is Austin Chamberlain. Uh, in 1922, he's the party leader uh, after Bonar Law had, had resigned with um, being ill with cancer. Uh, and, and, and Austin Chamberlain is very much on the side of the um, coalition. He says it would be arbitrary and mad to split from the Liberals with the current danger which faces us. Um, he does say, though, that the present situation needs reform, but he believes that uh, the coalition should be backed uh, and it should remain rather than the Conservatives going alone. Uh, most famously in the meeting is Stanley Baldwin, who's young and I don't want to say unknown, but he's not exactly one of the most famous Conservatives at the time. Uh, and of course, he gives this famous speech in which the specific phrase he uses to refer to Lloyd George is a dynamic force. Um, and he's implying that a dynamic force can be a good thing. So for innovation, the way that Lloyd George tackled the Lords, um, for example, or the social welfare reforms, uh, but also that a dynamic force can be a negative, as David Lloyd George has destroyed the Liberal Party and Baldwin believes that he's going to destroy the Tories next. Uh, Bonar Law speaks as well. It, he was kind of a last minute person to go um, to the meeting that people weren't really sure if he would, because of course he is uh, he is suffering from throat cancer, so he is unwell. Um, and he says, uh, and he's referring here to kind of Robert Peel and the Corn Laws um, and, and the, the issues that that had surrounding the Conservative Party then. But he said that the body that is cast off will slowly become the Conservative Party, but it will take a generation before it gets back to the influence um, which the party ought to have. So he's ready to get rid of Lloyd George essentially, that he believes that the Conservative Party is going to be destroyed. Interestingly enough as well, Arthur Balfour's there um, too. He's still a cabinet member. Um, he's in the Lords now rather than the uh, the House of Commons. Um, but he's he's pro-coalition. He says breaking up the coalition destroys the machinery that's best placed to, to fix the country's problems. So you do have a vote um, within it. As you can see, the kind of key players within the party kind of split on the issue. Um, and it's roughly about 187 that vote against the coalition and 87 that vote for the coalition. Though I will say that is a very, very disputed total number. Um, and as, as there's no real kind of written 100% definitive record of what it was. But I mean, we do know, obviously, that by a large majority, um, the Conservative Party voted against the coalition. Uh, in response to that, Lloyd George is probably a bit upset by it. Uh, he does though immediately pretty much that afternoon go to meet the king uh, and he resigns as prime minister. Um, as Chamberlain backs the coalition, it wouldn't really make sense for him to stick around as leader and become a prime minister of a government that he didn't really believe should exist, I suppose. Um, so Bonar Law is uh, invited by the king to become prime minister. Bonar Law says, I can't be prime minister without being party leader. So Chamberlain resigns. Uh, Bonar Law's back as the leader of the uh, Conservative Party and he becomes the new prime minister. So Bonar Law then, with uh, being a prime minister, thinks, all right, I've got to call a general election to get myself a mandate to be able to govern. That happens on the 15th of November 1922. And as we can see from the statistics here, you feel free to pause it and look at them if you wish, um, that the Conservatives have won uh, a nice, comfortable majority here. So you need 308 seats for a majority and the Conservatives end up winning 344. Uh, what is massively significant as well here is that this is the, uh, the first time in which Labour are the second largest kind of singular party and, and reached over 142 seats, which is uh, very significant. Um, OK, so Bonar Law goes into his ministry 
Um, but of course, as we know he dies very quickly um, due to the throat cancer that he's suffering. So the replacement for him uh, is, is Stanley Baldwin. Um, now, Baldwin wants to have a new radical type of reform uh, to put in place uh, in the country. What does he think is going to fix the unemployment issues? Uh, of course, it's going to be what we know what people love, tariff reform. No, they don't love it. Uh, and as we can see, uh, when Baldwin calls an election in 1923 on the issue of tariff reform, he loses that election. Now, the Conservative Party, as we can see from the statistics, are the single largest party, though they would be a minority government. So we can see 308 seats needed for a majority. The Conservatives win 258. Labour now, interestingly enough, up to 191. But we can also see if we compare it to where we were last time, is that in 1922, there were two Liberal parties. Uh, now the National Coalition Liberals have been dissolved uh, and they uh, are now a singular party, still led by Herbert Asquith. So uh, Baldwin resigns in January 1924 after about a month of having a minority government and he thinks I'll give it over to Labour and they can have a go at governing uh, and they do. So some of the policies that this minority Labour government bring in with Ramsay MacDonald as their prime minister are Wheatley's Housing Act, kind of increasing subsidies with a focus on social housing, um, the Doors Plan on an international stage as well, which alleviates German reparations, which is a large um issue on on kind of a European scale as people are thinking well a, a strong Germany in terms of an economic Germany could be a benefit in terms of trade and resources so uh, that's why the reparations are looking to be um, changed and on that secondary point there uh, Ramsay MacDonald says oh I love Russia spoiler alert nobody else does so when it comes to his formal recognition of the USSR as the um, actual government of Russia it is incredibly uh, controversial and offensive to many conservatives who are extremely anti-Soviet uh, now, he's racked with a series of controversies in his uh, minority Labour government uh, time as well. It's only about 10 months in office. Um, there's a whole issue over the Campbell case surrounding this particular socialist. Uh, when there is a vote to have an inquiry into the uh, the government's role in the Campbell case, uh, MacDonald says, if Parliament votes to have an inquiry into it, I will just resign as prime minister, uh, which he does uh, in November 1924. So he calls uh, another general election. So that is the third general election in the space of just under two years. Now, just a few days before the election, as we looked at last year, of course, um, something very sneaky and something very suspicious happens, which is the Zinoviev letter. So all of a sudden, this, this letter comes out, written supposedly by Zinoviev, who we know is a significant Bolshevik in the party in the USSR, um, giving a kind of formal backing, a formal support of the Labour Party, kind of calling on workers to revolt and rise up and seize the means uh, of production. Uh, and the Conservatives latch onto this letter and say you cannot vote Labour because then you are voting for socialism and you are voting for revolution uh, and the downfall of the country. And that resonates with a lot of, say, working class people as well who are particularly patriotic um, and, and like the traditional institutions. Now, as we kind of know, this letter is largely a forgery. We're not 100% sure where it comes from. Um, but does it benefit the Conservatives massively? Yes. So there are suspicions that perhaps some Conservative leaning individuals have, have chosen to write this letter up and create it and make, and make it up essentially. So you go into this election in 1924, huge Tory majority, you need 308 seats for uh, a majority, and the Conservatives win 412. Baldwin drops his tariff reform plans, which I think is a large help for the Conservatives to win um, in this election. Um, and the Zinoviev letter as well plays a huge role in that. But if you just look at the constituency map on the right, you can see the clear Conservative dominance in this election. Um, although, to be fair, Labour have only lost 40 seats from the last election, so it's not like uh, Labour have actually massively suffered from this election, more so the Liberals there, losing 118 seats overall. Uh, so there won't be another election until 1929 with this strong majority. So what is it that allows the Tories to be able to dominate in this period? Um, well, World War One plays a big role in that because the Conservatives embrace traditional values and patriotic values, which um, have been kind of present throughout World War One, but also resonate with a lot of, say, middle class and working class voters as well. Um, the redistribution of seats to the South is also a great help. So every 10 years on the census, they redraw constituency boundaries just to make sure that each constituency roughly represents the same amount of people. Uh, and what tends to happen is that the population grows larger in the South generally. So you tend to get more uh, seats in the South overall. Um, that's not engineering by the Conservatives. It's just simply people moving. Um, as well, Ireland since 1922 has split up into two, so Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State, meaning that there's only Ulster left in Ireland, meaning 
say, for example, the Liberals have lost the support of the Irish Parliamentary Party, um, whereas the Conservatives usually tend to dominate Ulster, so they've got a bonus there. Uh, we've already mentioned that the Conservatives are having middle and working class support or those that are particularly less radical in those areas, um, especially if they're offended by the Zinoviev letter. Um, massive levels of funding for the Conservatives coming from very rich donors. Uh, and alongside that, you also have the kind of newspaper baron support with, for example, the Daily Mail, uh, which is one of the most widely, widely uh, read newspapers across the country. Also worth commenting on as well, then why do the Liberals decline from 1922 to 1929? As we've seen, if we go back all the way to that last election, they're now down to 40 seats. And when we started the course, uh, say, time wise here, 18 years earlier in 1906, they're winning one of the largest majorities that Parliament uh, has ever seen. So why have they declined? Well, first off, they don't really have a source of income, um, largely because the Conservatives can rely on, say, the big wigs that are going to push money towards them that are incredibly rich. The Labour Party can rely on the trade unions with um, workers playing subscriptions that go to the party. The Liberals have no such source of income. So when it comes to, say, advertising and travelling around the country and touring, they just don't have um, a lot of money to be able to do that. Uh, the first past the post system in the country of watch um, is based on a plurality uh, enforces a two party system. So essentially to win in a constituency, you just need the largest amount of votes out of any of the candidates. So if you have a, a candidate that gets 30 percent, another one that gets 20, another one that gets 20, another one that gets 20 and then another one that gets 10, the one on 30 percent wins the vote. Right. So that means 70 percent of the vote in that constituency. They didn't vote for that person that won but all those votes count towards the votes overall. So what tends to happen for the Liberals is they're doing quite well in those constituencies, but then just not getting enough to win it, um, meaning that the two party system is reinforced where just Conservative and Labour are really winning elections by 1924, or winning constituency seats, sorry. Already mentioned the Irish nationalist support is gone. Uh, the traditional voters that would have voted for them have just gone to the other, uh, other two parties because they just have a larger chance to win through the two party system, but they're also representing what they kind of want. So the more traditional working class voters are now thinking, well, I'll vote for Labour because they clearly represent the working class. Um, or if you're somebody that's a little bit more patriotic, you'll vote for the Conservatives. Um, and uh, a chap called Dangerfield wrote a book. Uh, called the death of Ling liberal england in which he tries to look at a series of events which explain why does the liberal party get um, kind of destroyed and pushed to the wayside and he essentially argues that the handling of things like the house of lords reform and the, and the um, parliament act in 1911 uh, the role that they played with suffrage the role that the liberals played over ireland as well as the kind of split and the rift between asquith and david lloyd george all kind of just culminated together to create a party which was just not um unified and a unified party is, oh, sorry, a unified uh, a party which is not unified is never really going to win uh, an election. So who are the kind of main characters in this Conservative government? Well, we've got, of course, Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister. He's kind of seen as a safe pair of hands, um, a one nation Conservative. So he's a kind of individual uh, in the Conservative Party who's, who's looking at, at the acceptance of social welfare reform to help those uh, below if needed. Phrase to describe Baldwin sometimes as well as being kind of a steady Englishman, somebody that you can kind of trust. Uh, and that is reflected in the 1929 campaign as well. Um, and he's kind of a fan of what we can say is, is things like tranquility at home. So just kind of a steady life, uh, peace and disarmament abroad uh, and a return to the pre-war situation. This is going to come back and, and kind of bite Stanley Baldwin later when individuals like um, Michael Foote and socialists in 1940 write a book called Guilty Men, where they essentially blame Baldwin and other individuals for not preparing the country for the upcoming Second World War by focusing on things like disarmament. But of course, these individuals in the 1920s, there's no Nazi party yet. So the actual focus on disarmament is something that is extremely popular, particularly amongst the public. Um, we've got Neville Chamberlain, so son of Joe and brother of Austin, uh, is starting to play a prominent role in government now. Uh, so he's the Minister of Health from 1924 to 1929. Um, but he plays a large role in, in changing a lot of um, say social policies is really his area of focus so he changes pensions so rather than one that comes directly out of taxation it goes to a more contributory scheme as he believes that to be more affordable uh, and that is of course still the case uh, today um he also passes the national insurance act in 1925 so it means that you have an indefinite national insurance uh, claim if you can prove that your illness is going to be kind of debilitating over a number of years um whereas the initial national insurance act in 1911 set it at around 23 weeks that you could claim money and then after that it would just cut off 
Uh, and he also enacts a reform to local authorities in 1929, which is one of the largest sweeping reforms to local authorities kind of ever. So he transfers a large amount of power from Westminster to um, local authorities, so councils, with things like policies over your local roads, policies over your public health, policies over your local childcare, um, etc. Just to kind of save Westminster from doing it, but also allowing some individual councils to pick the needs of their own specific areas. Winston Churchill still kicking around. Um, he rejoins the Conservative Party in 1924. Uh, why does he do so? Well, we could, of course, say that it's just extremely political because uh, he knows that the Liberal Party is pretty dead by 1924. But he was a Conservative before, so he, he does have Conservative leanings in his policy. Um, he gets one of the biggest roles in the government. Stanley Baldwin trusts him, so he places him as the Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1924 to 1929, which he's actually quite surprised at, but um, he takes the job on anyway. Um, he said to in this period of work very well with others, gotten on well with a lot of the Conservatives, kind of gives very wide support as well to Chamberlain's social reforms, which are adding on to the Liberal firms earlier uh, in the 1900s. Churchill's very famous in this period for his kind of very effective handling in the general strike of 1926. Now, I suppose that will depend on your own uh, opinion on general striking and strikes in general, though, if we're just looking at it from a point of view of what Churchill, I suppose, is supposed to do, we can argue that he was effective in handling that. Um, and one of the most controversial things, though, he does as chancellor, and probably one of the worst things he does as chancellor, uh, is returning Britain to the gold standard in 1925. The gold standard is where you fix your currency's value to the amount of gold uh, that you have in your country. Uh, but what it meant was that the exports became uncompetitive and too expensive in comparison to American ones uh, and increased unemployment, particularly in places like mining. So where that leads us then is to the general strike in 1926, building on what we've just said about Churchill's um, rejoining of the gold standard. So because of that, mine owners were calling for wage cuts and longer hours because they essentially um, were struggling financially. Unions, of course, rejected this because they're looking after the interests of their members. Um, a commission is set up under, under Herbert Samuel on the left here, uh, which looks to see what we can do to fix mining. What it does recommend is a rejection of nationalisation, which really the unions want, which is the government owning and running and operating the mines. Um, but he kind of gives a general call that mining should be restructured, that maybe we should lessen the power of the mine owners and, and, and help out the mine uh, workers a bit. But it's a bit vague and a bit general. Um, and when the TUC, which is the Trade Union Congress, and the mine owners kind of look over and uh, dig deep into the document, essentially they just reject the parts that they don't like and then they accept the parts that they do like. So they're not really coming to a um, conclusion here. So the mine owners in a kind of threat say that we're just going to lock out workers from the 1st of May. We're not going to allow them in. Uh, we're not going to pay them. So Baldwin during this is trying to negotiate with both of these bodies to come to a conclusion and he has since kind of been criticized for not really doing enough to avoid a general strike here um with regards to the lockouts the tuc responds saying i want we want every single union to go on strike together um in, in a mass strike from the first of may to counter the lockouts that are happening uh the major transport union uh which is the transport general workers union supports the strikers by the 30th of april and say that if the miners go on strike we will go on strike with you this is what is referred to as a sympathetic strike because we're going to come back to that phrase later so in response to this baldwin just uses a piece of legislation called the emergency powers act created in 1920 he declares a state of the emergency on the 1st of may uh, he ends talks with the tuc and essentially this um, state of emergency gives the government wide reaching extra powers uh, whereby they can take over control of the country's resources uh, and try to keep the country running uh, through things like transport and getting people to work so what Baldwin and Churchill do is they create together the organisation of maintenance supplies. So to replace um, the workers that are going on strike, they get together about 100,000 ish workers to replace them. So to run things like buses and trams and trains. Um, Baldwin wins sympathy by giving speeches. He doesn't attack the strikers. He doesn't attack the workers. He just says that the strike is a threat to the Constitution. It's a threat to Britain. And it's, a, it's a threat to the way that it's governed. Uh, Churchill alongside this campaigns against the strike in his newspaper called the British Gazette, which is very popular, um, where he is a little bit more critical of the strikers. Um, one of the largest problems during this period for the TUC is they really just lack an organisation and a plan. Uh, they came into the strike just thinking, let's just go on strike and let's just kind of see what happens. Um, but it all starts to fall apart very quickly. So in response to the British Gazette, they make their own newspaper called the British Worker. But really, it's come a bit too late. And most people in Britain are reading Churchill's paper instead. Um, and all in all, the strike only lasts about nine days. And the TUC call it off. Um, but the miners still remain on strike. 
but they're just striking alone without the backing of the TUC. Uh, so what can we say are the results of the general strike in 1926? Well, clearly it's a, it's a massive failure from the point of the mine point of view of the miners. They don't win their demands. The TUC accept a compromise. They leave them alone. Uh, and eventually the miners will just return to work with worse pay and horrible hours and their bosses, you know, not exactly liking them very much. Um, so a big failure for them there. Um, the government go on, and we mentioned this earlier, the sympathetic strikes. The government will ban them in 1927 in the Trade Disputes Act um, to restrict uh essentially restrict general strikes from happening. Um, so the individual um, union will have to have a mandate to go on strike on their own issue themselves. So if I am a miners and I'm distributing pay, the bus workers can't go on strike with me because they think I deserve more pay. Uh, a general impact on the unions is that the more radical members of the union kind of fall more to the outskirts as this, but largely because the strike doesn't really work. Um, and more moderates in the party say, like an individual like Ernest Bevin, who will become and play um, a significant role in the Labour government from 45 to 51, kind of excel. So they're instead arguing for negotiation really of a, of a striking as a tool. Um, so the government one we can say is a restrike is also a result of the general strike and and effectively so and, and Baldwin comes out of it well initially though this piece of legislation the 1927 trade disputes act does turn workers bitter um and we can we'll see the results reflected in that in 1929 um labor come off pretty well um as they were silent during the strike essentially so Ramsey mcdonald doesn't comment on it um so looking a bit at the social history, what about women in Britain in 1922 to 1929? Well, after the war, women were thinking this could perhaps be a liberation moment. Uh, we could stay and work. Uh, we have rights expanded through voting. We can maybe get more. That's not the case. Traditional uh, women's roles are largely just reinforced um, for the most part. Uh, there are an increase of women in work, but if they are in work, they are severely underpaid in comparison to men um, and they are not and they are working more, say, service type uh, jobs. Uh, you do see an increase of women in Parliament. So one of the first um, women that kind of goes to Parliament and is effective in their job is, is Nancy Astor. Now, Nancy Astor does get her role in Parliament because her husband resigns because he goes to go on to the Lords. So technically, I suppose it's 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 getting in there with with connections to men. But Nancy does go on and be an effective uh, MP uh, in her role. Uh, and in 1929 as well, we'll see Margaret Bonfield be the first uh, cabinet member uh, as Minister La of Labour for the Labour Party um, too. Uh, and in addition to that, you do have a kind of big change in fashion for women uh, in this period as well. So it becomes famous for the flapper women, uh, which you might more associate with uh, America. But they also the fashions do become important in Britain, too. So women start having shorter hair. Uh, they start wearing, say, uh, dresses and have shorter skirts, um, showing their legs more, uh, but also, uh, say, doing more what would be seen as traditional male uh, things like, for example, smoking. Uh, the media is showing particular growth as well in 1922 to 1929. So, of course, newspapers have all, always been quite popular, but with the effects of the education policies from prior years starting to take effect uh, and with more and more people being able to be literate and read, uh, newspapers just grow massively. So, for example, by 1930, there are five major newspapers with one million roughly circulation every single day, or about eight years earlier, that was only two newspapers. Um, and you start to see an increase as well uh, in the uh, creation of magazines. So, for example, magazines as well that are particularly targeted at women. So, for example, the creation of Women's Weekly. Uh, you do see a growth as well in film uh, and cinema is, has essentially completely replaced the music hall uh, by this point. Um, so, for example, one particular British um, actor is, of course, Charlie Chaplin, as you can see here, uh, and his famous uh, character, The Tramp. Uh, and Charlie Chaplin, of course, is playing in films which have zero talking in them at all. It just plays a bit of music with, with cards with words on them. Uh, one problem that the uh, government recognises is they see that Americanization is becoming a bit too influential, they believe, on the country. So, for example, in 1925, only about 5% of the films in Britain are actually British films, and a large majority of them are coming from America. So the government responds to this with the uh, cinematograph, struggle to pronounce that, uh, Act in 1927, where they say that 7.5% of films must be British made, but you can see that's already a very small number. So they've kind of accepted that America has the money and it has the stars uh, and it has Hollywood. Uh, 
Um, one of the most significant films as well from 22 to 29 is The Jazz Singer, uh, released in 1927. And the reason why it's significant is because it has talking in it. Uh, and these films would be referred to as the talkies. Um, and you'll start to see Charlie Chaplin kind of decline. I mean, he's still a famous actor, but declined somewhat in his popularity um, due to the fact that he was more of an actor that didn't talk in film. Uh, you do also have the growth of radio. So you have, for example, the British Broadcasting Company created in, in 1922, uh, turned into a corporation and bought by the government in 1926, 27. Sorry, I can't remember the specific year off the top of my head. It's 26, 27 uh, and turning into the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, it's led by a man named uh, Mr. Uh, Reith, uh, John Reith. Uh, and what he sees radio as being is essentially not something that's necessarily entertaining, but something that is... Um, informative so the radio largely just plays classical music it just reads out long news items uh and it doesn't play on a sunday because that's when people should, should be at church but radio becomes extremely popular so i mean looking at the statistics at the bottom in 1922 there's 36,000 radio licenses in just four years that'll increase to two million and then two years later in 1928 over eight million um so more and more people are, are getting themselves a radio and getting them in their own houses so 1929 election, we've looked at economic, we've looked at social history, uh, and we've looked at the government, so how are they going to do? Going into this election campaign, you've got three parties with three major messages. Conservative Party, we can see from this image here, trust Baldwin, he will steer you to safety. So the message of the Conservative Party in 1929 is definitely safety first. Baldwin is a man you can trust, Baldwin is a man that's essentially going to look after you, uh, and Baldwin um, is somebody that you can place your faith in to guide the country towards better times come to why that's a bit of a rubbish campaign in a moment. Uh, Labour instead focused on a kind of socialist uh, commonwealth, a not massively radical um, proposal, but one in which they believe that, you know, with unemployment uh, high, uh, Labour can have work schemes which can tackle those kinds of things. Uh, and we can see in the poster as well that they're trying to connect to kind of British pastimes uh, by putting cricket in their posters, for example. Uh, and the Liberal Party, now led by David Lloyd George, as As Asquith has resigned as leader, um, we could argue are the most radical party when it comes uh, into this. They are uh, using the ideas of John Maynard Keynes to push across government funded work schemes through large government money being thrown into the country, um, uh, which David Lloyd George would help kind of get the country out of this kind of lurch uh, that it is in. Now, going into this election, what can we see with regards to these statistics? Well, we can see that the first time ever the Labour Party is the largest party. They have not achieved a majority, as you need 308 seats for a majority and they get 287, but they do have more seats than the Conservatives for the first time ever. So highly, highly significant. Why have the Conservatives lost this election despite the fact that they've you know, been quite successful? Well, we could argue that the handing of the general strike, whilst effective, did offend a lot of workers who no longer wanted to vote for the Conservative Party. We could also say Labour benefited off the fact that they didn't attach themselves to that, so they're not looking like a revolutionary style party. Um, but I think one of the biggest issues in 1929 is definitely the fact that Baldwin's campaign is, is a bit boring. It's not interesting. Um, and as there are still economic problems in the country, Baldwin doesn't really look like a person that's going to be able to do anything different to get the country out of the lurch that it's in. Uh, and despite the fact of the radical nature of the Liberal campaign, they only win 59 seats. So, um, I mean, if, to be fair, if we look at the votes, 5.1 million, you know, 3 million less than the other two parties together. But there's still it's still a significant party with a lot of people voting for them. But unfortunately, for the reasons we said with regards to, say, first past the post, uh, they're just not going to win elections anymore. So what are Ramsay McDonald's goals going into 1929? He's going to say, nah. His Chancellor Snowden said to him, I don't think we should form a minority government. I think we should let the Conservatives do it or perhaps try and work with the Liberals. MacDonald says, I'm just going to ignore you, Snowden. We're just going to form a minority government anyway. I think we could do this. Maybe the Liberals might back us because they're seeming a little bit more radical too. So what are his goals? Well, he wants to increase the building of council houses, which is something he kind of um, focused on with the Wheatley Act prior in 1924. Uh, raise the minimum school leaving age to 15 uh, as well. Uh, take government control over London's transport system, a focus on international disarmament through the League of Nations, which again is actually something that a lot of parties are agreeing on anyway, um, and create some work schemes that are more successful than the Keynesian style suggested by David Lloyd George. So all looking pretty positive. I mean, it's going to be hard for him to government because, of course, he's got a minority government, but uh, it is looking like a bright future. But I'll know what's lurking around the corner. 
the Wall Street crash. Uh, and unfortunately for McDonald, uh, that's going to be a big issue um, in the fact that whilst the Wall Street crash is an American crisis and doesn't necessarily have an immediate impact on Britain in 1929, I suppose, not to use a cliche, but the kind of ripples of it uh, are going to reach uh, Britain and the, the already bad unemployment is just going to essentially get worse. OK, well, thank you for listening um, and I hope that was helpful. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>